So in today's video, I'll be taking Jordan Peterson apart. Oh yeah. Why I'm negative about positive psychology. Back to the story, because I've got a story to tell. So I've got some top tips on writing and the blackboard. If you are studying an undergraduate degree in psychology, you to think critically. It helps people like me stop doing stupid. Okay, now let me explain that clickbait of an introduction I just gave. Sorry about that, but I've got to keep my, my viewing figures up. Now, I'm not going to literally take Jordan apart, I'll be taking some parts of his arguments seriously and subjecting them to some critical analysis so that you can see the areas where you might usefully critically engage with his ideas. Now, this is not an attack on Jordan. Um, YouTube is a platform that can often appear to reward or encourage content that's, um, uh, let's say, quite combative. You know, it's, it's person A humiliating person B. It's like mind-to-mind -mind combat, you know, an orgy of hyper-aggressive nerd festings on their ontological differences. It's, it's intended to get you screaming at your screen like a banshee or hooting like an overstimulated footy fan. Now, no offense to footy fans or banshees for that matter, um, but YouTube can sort of set up this platform where it becomes quite combative. So uh, this is not, <laughs> in spite of the title, it's not me ripping Jordan apart. It's just engaging in some critical analysis of some of his uh, big ideas. Now this video is going to use edits from one of Jordan's talks, a video of his talk, one of his talks. It, it's edited because his talk was a bit too long for my video and I need to keep things as short as I can. It's, I don't think it's easy for people to you know, put, a ta put aside time to watch YouTube videos from start to finish. Now that said, this is going to be a bit of a long video, but there's a lot to talk about in response to Jordan's video. And I've tried not to disguise my edits of his video, so you should see them clear enough. And you can find the link to the full video in the description box on, um, if you're looking at this on YouTube. Um, and you can judge for yourself whether my edits are fair. Oh, the other thing to say is extraordinarily hot. <laughs> Here at the moment, um, still in summer in uh, tropical Queensland, so I may glisten a little bit because this studio I've had to turn off the air conditioning. You know, same old story. I go on about this a lot, I know, but I've had to turn off the air conditioning just so that the sound isn't so bad. And um, the other thing is, um, I go beyond the clip, the the video that Jordan's video. I go beyond the content of the video at times because. What Jordan's doing, he doesn't explicitly refer to some of his, uh, explicitly explain some of his key ideas. Um, the ones I'm going to focus on are the Jordan's belief that uh, intelligence is genetic and also that gender differences have a genetic biological basis. So he doesn't explicitly say that, but he does set up the he does the groundwork to establish those arguments. So I'm going to engage with those bigger arguments not because it's explicitly said in the video, in, in the clip of Jordan speaking, but because these are the ideas that he's doing the groundwork for in this talk that he gave. Okay, so let's begin with the first bit of the video. IQ is reliable and valid. That's the first thing. It's more reliable and valid than any other psychometric test ever designed by social scientists by a factor of about three. That's fact number one. Okay, we haven't got far in, have we? But I've, I've had to stop things here just to comment. So here's the statement Jordan has just made. IQ is reliable and valid. Now that sounds a clear and definitive statement. Yep, it's certainly spoken with confidence. But the one problem here is that reliability and validity are being described as somewhat binary concepts. You know, something is either reliable and valid or it isn't. <clears throat> but reliability and validity are measured on a nominal scale. It goes from one, zero to one. But it's not either zero or one, it's somewhere in between usually. Um, so it's a number in between zero and one. So a number like 0 0.65, you know, that's the sort of scale that reliability and validity are measured on. So actually there's not that much certain. You can't say something is absolutely reliable or wholly reliable. You know, it's, it's quite rare to be able to say that, and that's not actually what Jordan is claiming here, though it seems he is. Also, the measure of reliability and validity 
is a measure of probability. It's a score that says something about the probability of your test score from taking an IQ today, today will match your test score for taking an IQ test in a week's time. This is a measure of reliability. Or it's about the probability that you're actually testing what you think you're testing, i.e. that an IQ test is more likely testing for intelligence than, say, for concentration. You know, so if someone does... Someone gets a low IQ score because they've got low intelligence. Actually, um, maybe it's just because they're not concentrating. They're just easily distracted and didn't really read the questions on the test. So this is important because saying that an IQ test is reliable and valid and saying that's a fact could mislead someone who wasn't aware of what the concept of validity and reliability are about. You know, that actually there's more uncertainty about IQ than it looks as though Jordan is saying. You know, he's actually talking about probabilities, not certainties. So he might have just misspoken here. OK. Now, he then goes on to make a comparison, saying that compared with all other psychometric tests, IQ testing is the most reliable and valid than any other psychometric test ever designed by a social scientist by a factor of about three. Now, what does this tell us? Well, it sounds really impressive. Yep, it sounds as though IQ testing is really good. But you need to know more about the field of psychometric testing before you can tell if this is a reason why we should think that IQ testing is really good. You know, if the whole of the field of psychometric testing were shown to be poor, then saying that one of those tests is good because it's the best psychometric test does not mean it's a good test, it just means it's a good test relative to the other tests. And if the other tests are poor, then your IQ test is just a bit less poor. So it's like me claiming I'm a very fast runner when I'm in a race with a bunch of four-year-olds. You know, compared to four-year-olds, yep, I run fast, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm a fast runner. You know, in, in mo most people's understanding of what a fast runner means would be quite different from... <laughs> what they would see when they see me running, you know? But compared to four-year-olds, I'm, I'm damn fast. <clears throat> okay. So the problem with psychology and the social sciences is that <clears throat> we're, we're often focused on social behavior. And this is an area, unlike the physical sciences, where things are much less predictable. So, you know, gravity is a better predictor of behavior of a ball when you drop it than, say, psychometric testing is a predictor of a person's future performance in employment or education. Now, when you study the social behavior of people, you soon realize that people are complicated and really hard to predict. There's a lot more uncertainty in the social sciences generally, particularly when you're looking at human behavior. So again, these factual statements about reliability and validity and this being the best IQ, the best psychometric test that psychometricians have come up with might mislead people. You know, it must, might mislead people if they're not familiar with psychometric testing, the field of psychometrics. So let's go on next and carry on with the video. Fact number two is it predicts long-term life outcome at about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, which leaves about 85%, 70 to 85% of the story unexplained, but it's still the best thing that we have. Now, here we get another fact, but it... This isn't actually another fact. The extent to which IQ predicts long-term life outcomes is a measure of validity called predictive validity. So it's not a, another fact claim. He's making the same fact claim. Um, the issue, yeah, he's making the same fact claim. And, and, and the problem with this is you might mistakenly think that there's an accumulation of supportive evidence coming here, you know. Um, here is another fact, fact number two, but it's not another fact. It's the same fact that he just claimed in fact one. It's the same fact claim he's made, he just made before. But we do get some more information to help us make sense of the first fact claim. Fat, fat claim? Fat? First f fact claim. You know, the first claim he made, which is that IQ is valid. Here we get a sense of how low in absolute terms predictive validity is for IQ testing. So IQ scores at best only explain about 30% of people's life outcomes. Now, that sounds pretty low because, yeah, it is pretty low. Um, also, we get possibly misled here in another way. We're actually talking about correlations, not causations. 
And you might not be able to tell that from the way Jordan's speaking. Now, just to show you what this type of argument actually is, this sort of argument Jordan is actually making, because he's making an argument around correlation. Um, he's kind of saying that people, it's the equivalent of saying that people who are born with a dark skin pigmentation tend to do less well in life than people with light skin pigmentation. Um, less, when less well means things such as uh, lower incomes. Now that's not a causal statement. Skin pigmentation does not cause low income. But because two, the two things are correlated, <coughs> excuse me, it opens up consideration that black people might be responded to by society in the way that leads them into low income jobs. So the best it does is point to other issues that are impacting life outcomes. It points us to look for an explanation, um, you know, a further explanation. It, it, it begs the question, why is this happening? Why are these two things correlated? So in the instance with skin pigmentation, you know, you could explain that people who have dark skin pigmentation get low, end up in low income jobs because of racial discrimination. That's a pretty reasonable um, cause to put forward. So the link between IQ and life outcomes is not a causal link. The link just asks us to look for an explanation. It doesn't give us an explanation. So on to, let's carry on with the video. Ethnic differences. This is something you can't say anything about without, without immediately being killed. So I'm hesitant to broach the topic. He does, so wait, it doesn't mean he's going to be literally killed here, but interesting what comes next does effectively kill off some of his arguments in relation to race and IQ, you know, that bigger idea that he has. Um, it's one of the many controversial subjects he's spoken about. You know, he believes that intelligence is genetically determined and that black people have less intelligence than white people. So, yeah. Yeah, what's coming kind of kills that argument off. First of all, we should point out that race is a very difficult thing to define because racial boundaries aren't tight, right? So, and so when you talk about racial differences in IQ, you, you're faced with the thorny problem of defining race. And that's a big problem from a scientific perspective. But we'll leave that aside. Okay, so this is a bit of a worry. The way Jordan cites a counter-argument to his position and asks us to leave it to one side. The counter-argument he cites is a pretty robust one and it effectively demolishes his argument. I think Jordan kind of knows this and that might be why he's asking us to overlook it because if you look at that counter-argument you can't really move ahead with Jordan's argument. Here's the rub of the issue. If you can't assign people reliably, reliably to a racial group, what sort of argument do you have? You know, when a racial group is your key variable. You know, the, if the whole argument is premised on there being distinct racial groups, if you can't reliably assign people to racial groups, you can't make an argument linking IQ to race. Now, Jordan is absolutely right. Race is hard to define. It, and, and one of the reasons it's hard to define is it's not a biological variable. Now, I talk about this in a previous video, so I won't go over that again here. But this clip... It's actually extraordinary. I, I, I think Jordan knows he has effectively been killed in <laughs> regards to his argument about race and IQ. Certainly his argument has suffered a mortal wound, but he is going to make the argument anyway. Um, you know, he's just suffered a flesh wound, um, but he can carry on when actually he's suffered a mortal wound. Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look, it's just a flesh wound. Now, just a quick word. I'm using the term race because this is the key term that Jordan uses. Um, sometimes Jordan uses the term ethnicity instead, and that's largely because the concept of race is now discredited. You know, it's not seen as a scientific um, term because it's just too loose. But I'm using it because it, it is the discredited nature of the concept that's actually been deployed in the, deployed in the arguments about genetic inheritability, inheritability of IQ. So I'm still using the term race because that's central to the arguments that are being made, which, you know, are, <coughs> are discredited arguments. Somebody 
stood up at one point in one of my talks and vice blessed their hearts. Oh, no, that, that, this is a little bit of a side, but that, that just made me feel really uncomfortable. Like, it sounds quite mean and patronizing. Certainly it sounds unkind, you know, you, you can, you've been quite cruel to people who, you, who you disagree with. When, when you do that, people start to wonder if that's how you talk about them and behind their backs. You know, it's not a, it's not a good thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't like, I don't like that when you're kind of talking badly about someone just on the basis that they've put forward a view you disagree with. Okay, moving on. You asked me about the Jewish question, right? And the, the implication, it was actually someone Jewish, and the implication was that um, Jews are overrepresented in positions of authority and power. And I said, look, here's the, here's the situation, all right? Jews are overrepresented in positions of power and authority. But then let's open our eyes a little bit, eh? And think for like two or three seconds and think, hey, guess what? They're also overrepresented in positions of competence. And it's not like we have more geniuses than we know what to do with. And if the Jews happen to be producing more of them, which they are, by the way, then that's a pretty good thing for the rest of us. So let's not confuse competence with power and authority, even though that's a favorite trick of the radical leftists who always fail to make that distinction. Well, why does this overrepresentation occur? Because it does. It also there's also overrepresentation in political movements, including radical political movements. Okay, why? Well, answer one, Jewish conspiracy. Okay, that's not a very good answer. We've had, we've used that answer before. All right, but, but do we have an alternative? Well, here's an alternative. Now, he, now he, he proceeds down this path towards his argument that links race and IQ. Now, remember, he's already told us that racial groups are very hard to define. But now he's telling us that Jewish people, are, as a racial group, have a higher IQ than everyone else. Now his position is that intelligence is hereditable and immutable. You know, it's genetically hardwired and relatively unaffected by our social environment. You know you're as stupid or as clever as your parents, and your kids are going to be as stupid or as clever as you, and there's little to nothing that's going to change that. That's his argument. Now here is where it's getting interesting, the Jewish question. This example is used a lot by Jordan. There's something very interesting in his use of Jewish people as an example. Now clearly Jordan thinks this is a good example and I'm going to offer a couple of speculations as to why he might find it a good argument. Now when you see Jordan speak, you often hear questions coming from the audience that indicates some members of the audience hold views that are linked to the far right of the political spectrum. You know, he does attract people to his talks who have that political position because they're finding something of sustenance in what Jordan is saying. And Jordan's reflected on this himself and he's quick and keen to disassociate himself from right-wing extremism from those groups. And among the views from that far right um, end of the political spectrum uh, that Jordan identifies as the ones he finds particularly distasteful are the ones that are anti-Semitic. <clears throat> you know, hateful ideas about Jewish people. Now, I'm in full agreement with anyone who adopts a stance against uh, anti-Semitism, but we need to see this in the context of him not wanting his ideas to be linked to politics. Now, he wants to be seen as apolitical, with no allegiances either to the left or the right. Certainly, um, to the, he doesn't want to be seen as an, an either end of the extreme on the political spectrum. He'd prefer not to be seen on the political spectrum at all. So you saw him in that clip positioning himself against the political right and the political left. And he does this a lot. He celebrates how he annoys people on both sides of the political spectrum, on both the political right and the political left. And it gives his audience a sense that he might be beyond politics. And sometimes he describes his position as beyond politics, that his ideas are operating at a much more fundamental or important level. Now, his disassociation from politics is a useful position to adopt um, if he's seeking some form of popular support for his ideas, uh, particularly at a time when people talk about 
historically low trust in politics, uh, public trust in politics. So it might be particularly useful to position yourself um, as apolitical if you're talking to the populace, um, perhaps more than you're talking or speaking to specialists or professional groups like psychologists or more generally to academics. So he gives the appearance of being above politics, above all of that nonsense. Um, but, yeah, so he wants you to convince people that he's got no political axe to grind. But he does have a political identity. When he's pushed, he'll say that he's a conservative thinker. And there's some reason to think that he holds beliefs that align him with conservative Christian thinking. Um, as he does identify himself also to be a Christian, and he appears to support socially conservative policies, and he appears to want to apply his understandings of Christianity to law and public policy. However, he says he remains agnostic on some of the key tenets of Christianity, and that leads some people to say that actually he's not a Christian at all. You know, for example, he stated that he's agnostic in relation to the resurrection of Christ. It actually appears he, he's still thinking all of this thing all of this through, you know, he's thinking through his religious stance. Um, but it's clear that he is a religious man, you know, he, he will say that he's a religious man. Um, but at the minute he's quite vague about the extent of his religious conviction. So that means that none of what I'm about to say is certain, you know, it's all conjecture. Um, but I think some of what I'm about to say might make sense. It might help us to make sense of this kind of vagueness that we have in relation to Jordan's political identity. Okay. Um, quick question. Are you a Christian? I suppose the most straightforward answer to that is yes. Although I think it's, it's, let's leave it at yes. Well, there's, I, I, I'm a bit dissatisfied with that because there are so many kinds of Christians and I, I, I would never imagine that you were a very literal minded Christian. So this is all up for debate, but does it help us make sense of Jordan's work if we were to consider him a Christian conservative, also known as Christian right? I think it is a way of making sense of his position in regards to black people and Jewish people. If we were to assume he held some sympathy for Christian conservatism, it would give us one way of making sense of the reason why citing the example of Jewish people is for Jordan a good example. The Christian right draws support from politically conservative Jews and is linked to Christian Zionism. This is the support for the idea that Jewish people should return to the land of Israel. And for some Christian Zionists, it is believed that once this is accomplished and once Jewish, uh, Jew, Jews convert to Christianity, it will signal the second coming of Christ. So Jewish people are a group who are important to the Christian right. So Jordan's argument that imputes high levels of intelligence among Jewish people as part of the natural order of things sits comfortably within that religious political group. Now how about his views on the intelligence of black people. Well, what he's doing, in his argument, one group has to be described as less intelligent if the race IQ theory is to work. The intelligence is a genetic attribute which is distributed unequally between racial groups. Now, maybe black people just drew the short straw here. You know, they just ended up being that group who are seen as less intelligent. But, but Christian conservatives actually draw ideas and support from other areas rather, other than the Jewish community. Christian, the Christian right also commonly draws support and sustenance from Mormonism, um, which might best be described as, let's say, having a rather complicated history in relation to the notion of race, <coughs> specifically in relation to black people. And, uh, and it still grapples with a system of beliefs that are hard to describe as anything other than racist. Now, the, the, the Mormon church has kind of gone on, undergone a degree of reform. It started sort of 1970s, really, um, to try and uh, be less racist. But the legacy of its historical racist practices is still there. Now, if you don't know about this um, and don't know much about Mormonism, Mormonism largely excluded black people from its church in the past. And because... Historically, Mormons held the view that black people were descended from Cain, 
the, the figure in the Bible. And Cain is the cursed figure in the Bible. This is the guy who killed his brother Abel. And God got pretty upset <laughs> with Cain um, for doing that. So Cain is um, yeah, a problematic figure in the Bible. He's a cursed figure. And black people, according to Mormon scripture, were descended from Cain. So they're the cursed people. So, it's, you know, you can, you can see where that could be seen as racist. Now, in the context of Jordan's uh, systems of religious beliefs, and remember this is still conjecture, as I've not heard him speak in any detail about this specifically. He, I don't think he's spoken in much detail, detail about this specifically in public. Um, it may mean... It may not be troubling at all for him to evoke an argument that positions black people as the losers and Jewish people as the winners in the genetic theory of intelligence. It raises the question as to whether what he's doing is signalling to some in the Christian uh, right, in Christian conservatives, that he's willing to draw from doctrine, or at least that he's sympathetic to doctrine that positions black people negatively and Jewish people positively. It's interesting that Jordan mentions Cain and Abel, um, the Cain and Abel story uh, throughout um, the 12 Rules book, you know, his very popular self-help book. So it's kind of interesting, you know, there's a, there's the, there's the start of a connection there perhaps. So I'm, what I'm asking is whether we can understand Jordan's use of the Jewish example is the positioning strategy, you know, to position him away from extreme right groups, but at the same time signalling some level of correspondence in his work with the Christian right. But if he's doing this, this creates tension in uh, Jordan's position. That might be one of the reasons he's found himself in the model fire pit that he has. The the tension that he's created here is that by pushing the genetic argument to explain why Jewish people are often in powerful positions and why black people are often in powerless positions and saying that's because of their competence linked to IQ and it's genetic, by putting forward that argument he gets pulled towards the extreme right, uh, to extreme right thinking which is linked to anti-Semitism. It's through supporting, the purport, through supporting the purported link between genes and IQ, he's engaging with eugenic thinking, which is also known as race science. And this is the project behind the genocide committed by the Nazis against, amongst others, Jewish people. Jordan is effectively rehabilitating race science to make it palatable to a broader audience. And the means by which he's doing this is... Um, first, by alluding to scientific evidence for racial differences in IQ, by presenting a distortion of both biological and psychological research. Second, second, <laughs> second by latching on to young people's disaffection with political correctness, uh, largely formed because they the generation that were born too late to have felt the full friction of the civil rights movements in the 1960s and 70s clashing with the status quo and born too soon to see the successful outcome of those movements in full. Um, third, by latching on to the notion that there is a war on freedom of speech being waged largely by the political left. Um, and 4.4 by capitalizing on young men's confusion in regards to cultural challenges to traditional masculinity. Now what he's found is a pinch point of congested thinking between these areas, these five areas, to which he's purporting to um, provide a way out or a way through. Uh, and he's doing that through engaging with science, rationality, and also just demonstrating the courage to speak an inconvenient truth. And I think this is what seems to be persuasive about his message to a lot of people. Okay, that was a long and detailed exposition, but I, I still made some big generalizations, but I, you know, I just want to put the general idea to you that if it's the begin, you know, it's the beginning of a way of thinking about Jordan's thinking um, in relation to why he uses the, the Jewish example in this exposition of the race IQ argument, and why he appears, in spite of his stance against anti-Semitism, 
so attractive to extreme right-wing groups who are anti-Semitic. It <coughs> raises the question of where his race IQ theory might be coming from and why it appears to some that he's seeking to rehabilitate eugenics and race science into mainstream thinking. But in a way, it's kind of retooled from being anti-Semitic to anti-Romany and, uh, and anti-disability um, to being um, one that's purposefully um, anti-black and how, how the heck he's managed to acquire um, such an apparent devoted following for all of this. You know, I mostly think that many of his followers are kind of sleepwalking into a moral quag quagmire that Jordan's created for us all. You know, raising the immediate threat of a return to race politics and eugenic-inspired social policy. That's my worry. Now, to the second possible reason why he's citing the Jewish example in his exposition of race IQ theory. Now, I promise I won't talk so long about this reason, as it's relatively simple, but I think, nonetheless, it's interesting. He might be deploying the Jewish example as a rhetorical strategy. By that, I mean he's deploying it for effect to win the argument rather than for content, you know, to inform the argument. And by using Jewish people as an example of a group who might have been seen in a positive, might be seen in a positive light through considering the argument about the link between IQ and race, it creates a moral shield around the race IQ argument coming under critique. The nature of the argument, using the Jewish example, puts the critic in an uncomfortable spot. So if your argument is that Jewish people are members of the most intelligent racial group, and that this is explained via genetics, it places the critic of the race IQ argument in the position of arguing against the notion that Jewish people are naturally more intelligent. And this can be easily misconstrued as a signal for anti-Semitism, you know, that you oppose to a view that casts Jewish people in a favourable light. The moment the Jewish example is used in an argument about race and IQ, it opens up the critic to the crude accusation of being an apologist for Hitler and the Holocaust. Now, if you've ever tried to open up discussion of, say, human rights abuses against Palestinians perpetrated by Israel's political administration, you may well have experienced this crude and unwarranted criticism of being anti-Jew, anti-Semitic. Now, what you might be seeing here in Jordan's argument um, is He's essentially using Jewish people as a political tool to silence critics. Now that sounds harsh, and I'll, I'll, I'll give Jordan the benefit of the doubt here and say that I don't think he's intentionally doing that, because if he were, that would be utterly appalling. Um, but this kind of explanation snaps out at me precisely because Jewish people are being used as an example to confirm a eugenic position. That Jordan has become kind of an apologist for race science, which is a position that has underpinned anti-Semitism. There's a strong sense of perversion in Jordan's arguments here. That That's the thing, I think, that's making scholars feel very uncomfortable. End of that last clip. I showed you Jordan uh, setting up a straw man counter-argument to his position. He says the explanation for why Jewish people are in so many positions of power is because of a Jewish conspiracy. He then denies that argument and puts forward a better argument. The use of the Jewish conspiracy argument as a counter-argument is, you know, it's a ridiculous argument. It, it, the, the Jewish conspiracy argument is ridiculous. It's poorly evidenced. It's easily dismissed. Now, Jordan chooses not to dismiss the counter-argument in his video in any detail. He just rejects the counter-argument through proclamation, you know, rather than explanation. He raises his voice and proclaims that it is not so. You know, but perhaps he was short on time. In any case, I didn't mind that. I didn't object to that dismissal of that counter-argument because I know that counter-argument is sloppy. I already know that it's weak. I don't need to be told it's weak. Uh, the, you know, uh, the problem with conspiracy arguments is that it, they're really hard to prove. It's really hard to find evidence for them. They're really weak on those grounds. But I don't like the way he just pushed it aside because other people might not know the weaknesses in that argument. They might not know it's weak. And you need it to be guarded against anyone who cites the counter-arguments and then just swipes it away without any reference to why, other than using their authority to push it away, 
to just say, no, that's ridiculous. And everyone going, yes, that's a very clever man. I'm sure that thing was ridiculous. I trust him. Yeah, that's really risky. If you, if you swipe away counter arguments just purely based on your authority, um, that's, quite, that's really risky because if your authority diminishes and you disappear off the scene, that counter argument is still there and that can creep back in. You know, because people don't know why it's weak. You said it's weak. Now people don't believe in you anymore because your authority has been challenged or has been diminished for some reason. You know, maybe you got involved in a sex scandal or something. Now people don't believe you anymore, but they don't know why not to believe this counter argument. Okay, so don't don't push counter arguments aside. Don't dismiss them. Explain why they're wrong. Now, the other problem is he uses this straw man argument, you know, a weak argument is his counter argument. And he does that to strengthen his own argument. So he says how, you know, he asks, right, that, was it Jewish conspiracy? No, that's nonsense. So how else can we explain? What other alternative is there to the stupid Jewish conspiracy argument, that horrid argument, that crappy explanation? What can save us? from that terrible explanation. What alternative is there? Well, I have an alternative for you, you know? And then he offers you, or offers us, the IQ explanation. Now, he, he's already conceded that the thing that might bias the IQ results of black people might be the very thing that biases the life outcomes for black people as well, which, which would render many of the measures of the predictive validity of IQ tests useless. Now, that issue still applies here. Maybe a bias in IQ testing is the same bias in life chances. So it's not IQ that explains the position of Jewish people in advantageous, powerful positions, but something else. And there are alternative explanations, such as cultural norms among Jewish people. Now, what Jordan is doing, he's setting us up for the genetic argument, and he's ruling out by the way he's presented his alternative to the Jewish conspiracy, he's kind of saying, this is really the viable alternative to that nonsense. He's ruling out those other explanations. Now, he could have offered an explanation as culture. You know, culture accounts for why we see these, why we see Jewish people overrepresented in positions of power and competence. And um, culture offers us an alternative to that because what Jordan is doing is using a straw man technique to make his arguments appear strong. The cultural argument could be that, yeah, that norms amongst Jewish people are about conscientiousness and study. Um, that's always been a feature of uh, uh, Jewish culture, about study. It used to be about the religious texts. Um, then it shifted to more generally about study of the sciences. And it's no wonder, really, that um, many Jewish people do very well in the education system because it's embedded in their kind of cultural beliefs linked to their religious identity, the importance of study. Anyway, let's move on. Most engineers are male. Why? Because men are more interested in things and women are more interested in people. And you might say, well, that's sociocultural. It's like, no, it's not. Okay, now Jordan is getting to this, his view that gender differences in education and employment are biological, not social cultural. Women and not represented in particular in particular occupational groups and are underrepresented in positions of power, e.g. upper middle, middle management roles and so on, because of their level of competence. And that's determined by their biology, um, not determined by patriarchy or oppression. Now, this is just the precursor to that argument that he's laying out, you know, he's laying out the groundwork for that argument that um, gender differences are biological differences and women are biologically different in relation to their levels of competence in certain areas than men. And that explains why women are less represented in some occupational groups. Now, did you notice we started off with a whopper of a stereotype? He offers a quick counter argument to the position he's going to make, but dismisses it. Um, and then he paves his way for his own argument for the biological basis for gender differences in occupations. Now notice 
he's showing how the counter argument is false before he presents his own argument. And did you notice what happened when he brought in the counter argument? He deflected our attention away from the assertion that men are interested in things and women are interested in people. He's kind of made you accept that as true by providing a counter argument for what causes the difference. You know, he said, here's the difference. Now, what accounts for that difference? Now, pe some people say it's all about culture, social, cultural. Then he says, no, it's not. And I'm going to tell you why it's not. So see what he's done. He's kind of established that there are these big gender differences. And then he's looked at the reason why. And now he's arguing, trying to make the case to explain the difference. He's not actually offering a counter argument for the stereotype uh, that he's just made. You know, that he's just said that uh, women are more interested in people, men are more interested in things. Uh, this is usually a sign that someone is using a bit of rhetoric to misdirect you. Now watch out for that. Because here he's just let fly by, he's just let a stereotype fly by you without any interrogation. And he's put you in a position where you have to accept that stereotype as true. He's kind of sort of like tricked you into thinking that you've engaged critically with the assertions he's made, but you haven't because there's a premise that he's kind of made you accept prior to that critical engagement that's actually about something else. What's also interesting is that there is room for critically engaging this stuff about things and people, um, not least because he's set up this dichotomy that some people would argue that is a false dichotomy. He's set up as things and people as discrete entities. Now, maybe if you already accepted the premise to be true, that, you know, the thing that he's just said is common sense, it sounds intuitively true to you, that men are more interested in things and women are more in interested in people. But it's easy to reverse that in a way that still makes some sense. You do have to do a little bit of extra work by giving an example. Um, but you can still pass off a stereotype that just reverses those polarities between people and things. Um, and it perhaps has enough sense to it. And if you do it quickly enough, people will just accept it. And you don't have to argue for it. People just accept your premise as true. Um, so I'll have a go with you. I've already told you that what I'm doing, but um, <laughs> I'll have a go with misdirection. So um, do you know, we know that women are more interested in things. You know, they look at, their, look at their obsession with shoes and handbags. And we also know that men are more interested in people, you know, like going out with their mates um, or competing against people, you know, always in competition with people, always in competition with their mates or people at work. So we know that men are more interested in people and women are more interested in things. Now, what explains that difference? Well, some people will say it's social cultural, right? <laughs> but you get what I'm doing there. So see, see what I've done. I've just set up this um, kind of crude stereotype. I've flipped around what seemed to be an intuitively true stereotype that Jordan asked us to accept. I've switched it around and you can get away with making that stereotype seem true as well. You know, there's a sort of self-evident truth in what I've said. And but actually needs interrogating. Okay. Now, something else is interesting here about that claim of gendered interests. It's about being an, setting forward an inappropriate dichotomy. Um, things versus people. This is too simplistic and it can be thought of as a false dichotomy. Now, to accept this dichotomy, you have, have to accept a particular ontological position behind it, which is that people and objects are necessarily distinct. And this is an ontological view that posits that objects have a material reality existence that's unconnected from the subjective art of observing those objects. Now, this is the separation of object and subject. And it's the same dichotomy that the rest of the argument he makes rests on, which is all about being able to separate nature and nurture, setting that up as a dichotomy. You can tell if something's more nature or more nurture. Now, the pre this premise is contained in Jordan asking you if the differences we see in gendered groups, it, between gender groups, is, is it culture or is it biology? You know, that's a, a dichotomy he's setting up for you, which 
some people would argue, is false. And he goes, it's definitely not culture, and I'll tell you why. You know, so he split culture from biology, and he said, it's not culture. So he set up his case for it must be biology, because they're a dichotomy, they're discrete entities. So it's all about the nature-nurture dichotomy that you've been subtly forced to accept through the way he's snuck in those unexamined premises. Now, incidentally, this nature-nurture dichotomy has largely been rejected by modern genetics that states the human experience and behaviour is an extraordinarily complex interaction between nature and nurture. Our genes and our environment are enmeshed. You know, it, it makes, we're not able to disentangle them and it may, may make no sense to try and disentangle them. They're part of the same thing. Now, Jordan comes from a philosophical and epistemological position that's common in psychology that posits a relatively simple dichotomy between objects and subjects or nature and nurture. Incidentally, this is why mainstream psychology has seen little reason to move beyond classical statistical analysis and statistical inference that relies on the practice of estimation and significance testing. Classical statistics is a pretty limited application. Mostly it's good at finding relationships in the observation of relatively simple and trivial phenomena, like the outcome of a coin spin. It becomes less and less useful the more complex the phenomena you're looking at. Um, I'll put a link to a nice little site that explains um, the problems with classical statistics. So you can have a look at that if you have a mind to. Sorry, it is a little bit, bit of a detraction, but I think it's, it, it, it's an in, interesting path to go down. It's an interesting line of inquiry because it um, raises some interesting questions about psychology and about the type of statistical analysis it uses and what that says about its view of what it's looking at, you know, the degree which it understands the complexity of human behaviour. OK, let's move on, because <laughs> I'm sweating. Um, I hope you've been <laughs> Maybe I'll be yeah, taking a break during this video. I haven't yet, but I'll carry on. OK, next bit of the video. And we know that because if you stack up countries by their, by their egalitarian social policies, which you can do quite effectively, and then you look at the over-representation of men in STEM fields, the over-representation increases as the countries become more egalitarian. So it's not socio-cultural. Okay, now let's move to Jordan's argument against a cultural explanation for gender differences in occupational groups. What he describes here is known as gender equality paradox, the finding that in more egalitarian societies, typically Nordic countries like Denmark, Finland and Sweden, you find fewer women, women working in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We've known about this for many years, but it's, it's a misrepresentation to use this argument as a nullification of social cultural influence over gendered occupational choices, or as some sort of evidence for um, biological predetermination. If it's not nurture, it must be nature. Um, you know, the nurture-nature dichotomy I was just talking about. Um, the thing that he got you to accept is a hidden premise behind his argument. Well, the actual researchers who've done this work on this um, gender paradox generally say that this, the gender paradox is evidence that um, they're, they're not evidence that there's no or minimal social cultural explanations for gender differences in preferences for girls to study STEM subjects or women to undertake STEM-based careers. The conclusions these research and make, researchers make from their work is that this, it's raining. You probably, maybe you don't hear this if I've got my sign set up properly, but just in case you, in case you hear a little bit of hissing in the background, um, it's raining. <sighs> it's going to get humid. Ah, distracting. I've been distracted. That's why I never do well on my Q tests. Or oh, actually, it might be because I'm stupid. Anyway, <laughs> let's get back to the point quick. Right, so the conclusions made from this work by the researchers doing this work is that it's not that there's no social cultural impact or that it's reduced, but 
actually they say it's much more nuanced or it's much more complicated than we might have imagined. They're saying that rather than making the nurture-nature distinction clear, it's actually muddying it, that it's making that distinction less clear. It's suggesting that there's a much more complicated interaction happening between people and their environments. Uh, for one thing, it might mean that there's an interaction between social cultural and socio-economic factors. So in countries that have more egalitarian social polities, I'll just work this, I'll tell you what this counter-argument is about because it's really interesting. You know, that the gender paradox might actually be pointing to a much more complicated um, interaction with the social environment. So in egalitarian countries, social policies, um, in countries that have egalitarian social policies, they also tend to have greater income equality and also greater income stability, you know, lower unemployment. Uh, they tend to be more economically st stable in terms of employment, um, just more economically stable generally. Um, also, in terms of employment, it's a less risky environment for people in terms of choosing an occupation to join and therefore what you study at school. You know, what, what should I study at school? What sort of job should, am I looking for? It becomes less risky. <clears throat> you know, you don't have to worry about putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, it, there's less risk in making occupational choices, less financial risk, less worry about your financial security because the job market is stable. You know, no matter what job you go into, it's going to be relatively well paid. It's certainly going to pay your bills and it's going to be relatively stable. It's unlikely you're going to lose your job. Now, in less egalitarian societies, um, STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering and maths jobs, tend to be well paid and relatively stable in an otherwise unstable economy. So what you might be seeing in the gender paradox um, in relation to more women entering STEM jobs in non-egalitarian societies is the impact of that socioeconomic environment in an unstable, insecure labour market, which is encouraging more women to study STEM and to take STEM jobs, as this provides them with better economic stability. You know, if you have to make a choice between fitting in with gendered norm expectations and putting food on the table and having a roof over your head, um, you're likely to ditch gendered norm expectations. You know, if you're a, a woman living in such circumstances, um, in an unstable economy, you're in, in one of those societies, desperately unequal society, unstable economy, you're worried about economic stability, you're worried about being able to consistently put food on the plates and be able to pay the bills. You're not going to worry if people, you're going to go into STEM, study STEM subjects and aim to get a job in the STEM industry uh, because you're not worried that people are going to think you're a geek or you're losing your femininity. Your priority is in basic issues of survival, you know, um, for you and your family. Now, if you're living in an economically stable society where STEM jobs are no more stable, no better paid than any other jobs because the economy is stable and income inequalities are low and welfare support is generous, um, so you can follow gendered norm expectations without any financial penalty to you. Your choice is less likely to be influenced by economic insecurity. Um, sorry, economic security provided by any particular job because most jobs are stable. And even if you end up in a job and then you lose your job because um, those jobs change or that industry dries up, the welfare support is sufficiently generous, generous to tie you over till you find your new job. Now, the argument Jordan is putting forward is that the sociocultural context has shifted in those countries in a way that disrupts traditional gendered norm expectations. You know, social policy is disrupting traditional gendered archetypes. Men are being encouraged to become nurses and women are encouraged to become engineers. So he's saying that um, if this social cultural shift doesn't impact gendered behavior, then gendered behavior must be biological. You know, he's saying that, look, um, 
more women aren't going into engineering in spite of all the social policy that's encouraging women to do that. So it must mean that those preferences that women are making are biological. They're not based on cultural factors. That, that's what he's saying. Now, the paradox he's, he's citing here only exists if you assume you know, the paradox that social policy, cultural norms, cu social policy as can, uh, cultural norms, <laughs> so if social policy is changing cultural norms to dismantle gender stereotypes, but if the gender, gender stereotypes exist in spite of that, then gender stereotypes are based on something biological, not social or cultural. You know, that's the paragraph. And par paradox but but that paradox is only a paradox if you assume that intrastate policy and intrastate cultural production is the key determinant of cultural norms in an open and free democratic nation the problem with that argument is that people are exposed to social cultural products that come from outside of the nation state the argument Jordan makes rests on a hidden premise that these egalitarian countries are somehow hermetically sealed in relation to social cultural influences from outside of their national borders. Actually, egalitarian societies tend to be freer, more open and more democratic than non-egalitarian societies. Our transnational cultural products are more likely to be entering into those egalitarian nation states because citizens have greater freedoms and economic resources to access and consume those products. You know, citizens have more income to purchase foreign media content, more leisure time to consume that content, and more dispersed, more technologically advanced and less state-controlled communications infrastructures to distribute that content, and more freedom of movement both in relation to immigration and immigration. You know, the statistics on media consumption in Nordic countries substantiate this point. You know, they're consuming lots of con foreign content and they're actually, young people in particular, are spending much more time on YouTube and um, Netflix than watching over-the-air national TV broadcast. So it's a rather naive understanding of social cultural influence to think that it can be so readily isolated to state-based jurisdictions. You know, so his argument that Nordic countries, these egalitarian countries that have these egalitarian policies, are providing us with this gender paradox that, um, in spite of social policy that is dismantling gender stereotypes and saying women can be engineers rather than nurses, that women are still preferring to be nurses, that this is evidence that those gendered um, preferences are not social, cultural, they've got to be biological. Well, no. No, that would only be really the case if it were ever the case, if you were talking about a totalitarian state where there are no outside influences coming in, no cultural, social influences coming in from outside of that nation state, where the media is strictly controlled and where immigration is prohibited, or in a nation state which is geographically and technologically isolated. But those countries are not part of the stated paradox. You know, he's talking about free and open countries as the countries that are showing this paradox. So Jordan's analysis of the gender paradox is very limited, and he's misreporting or selectively reporting on that research. You know, he fails to factor in socioeconomic impact, he fails to understand how culture transcends national borders, and he fails to report on how this research is actually concluding, you know, these researchers are writing, when they report this research, they are concluding that social cultural factors are likely to be more complex and more, complex impl more complexly implicated in gendered occupational choices. Now, another issue that's closed over um, is that, uh, um, and one that's quite important, is that Jordan fails to... He, he, Jordan doesn't talk about this, but, but it's actually part of the paradox, but he, he doesn't talk about it. All of that research, tell me what all that research shows. 
particularly in those non-egalitarian countries where women are taking STEM jobs and, um, and girls are studying STEM subjects in schools, is that girls and women are competent at those jobs. They're competent. Girls are competent at studying STEM subjects and working in STEM fields. And men, uh, as competent as men. Yeah. Next clip. We're getting to the end. Don't worry. We're nearly there. Oh, boy. The best place to look at that is in Sweden, where the egalitarian policies have been laid out for a long period of time, and you can, you can get a more direct inference about biology. Okay, Jordan here is talking about sex differences in aggression, and I've edited that out just to save some time. But what I wanted to do here is just show you how he's making that similar argument, that when you look at a country that has egalitarian social policy, it provides you with an example where the social cultural explanation for sex differences or gender differences either doesn't apply or is sufficiently cancelled out to allow us to see the impact of biology more clearly. This is a false argument for the reasons that you know, I just said. Again, it's not what the researchers are telling us who undertook that research, but it but it also assumes biological and cultural factors are discrete where rather biologists and geneticists tells us, tell us that um, they're enmeshed. Social cultural factors, biological factors are enmeshed. <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm getting tired. <laughs> okay, so back to IQ. One final thing to say about IQ. The ethnic differences are difficult to dispense with. It's not easy to make them go away. You can say, well, the tests aren't culture fair. Well, here's a test of that. So imagine you, you test group A with an IQ test and you test group B with an IQ test. And then you look at their actual performance in whatever you're predicting. If the test was biased against ethnic group A, then it would underpredict their performance. And that doesn't happen. Now you could say, well, there's systemic bias in the performance measures and the potential measures. And that's a possibility. All right. Okay. Now, I just wanted to draw attention again to this danger of something that happened at the start here where, of this long video that we've worked our way through. Um, where Gordon, Gordon? Jordan. Jordan acknowledges that it's empirically hard to place people in racial groups. But he brushes that aside though actually that argument collapses the argument that he's about to make here we see it again you know he acknowledges that there's a counter argument but he seems to brush it aside or at least sees no need to defend against it which gives an impression that it's not a counter argument that would do any serious damage to his position or his argument that the counter argument is not a strong one the claim is you know this counter argument that iq testing is culturally biased. Now what he, what Jordan Peterson is saying is it's not culturally biased. Um, and the evidence is on this correlation between low test scores of black people on IQ tests and poor employment outcomes. Now he offers the counter argument and saying, well, maybe there's a bias both in the IQ testing and in the employment outcomes. Maybe there's a bias against pe black people in employment decisions. Maybe that is the issue that there's a cultural bias against black people. And that's actually a really strong counter argument. And there's actually significant empirical support to substantiate that actually black people are being discriminated against in employment. And the cause of that is what we call racism. Um, it's an, it's an argument that you can't easily dismiss, let's put it that way. But Jordan Peterson just pushes it aside. He just said, oh yeah, yeah you know, it could be the, you know, it could be there's a bias in the IQ test and there's a bias in employment decisions in the labor market. So yeah, maybe that's going on, but yeah, that could be going on. But then he just, it's almost like a, he flicks it away and gets on with his argument of why, you know, IQ tests have good predictive validity. Now my advice to you is don't allow those counter arguments to be flipped away or swept away like that without having a proper look at the strength of those counter arguments. And by the way, if I flip away counter arguments, um, yeah, 
look at what I'm flipping away. Don't just trust me. Don't rely on, if you think I have any authority, don't rely on that. Saying, oh, he just, he flipped that argument away. Oh, he, that, that argument must be nonsense because Paul is a very intelligent man. God, <laughs> God help you if you think that. <laughs> anyway, you haven't seen through the, the illusion of intelligence that just is, is there because of having the social status of being an academic. <laughs> anyway, sidetracked, stop that. So if I ever do that, don't, don't not look at those arguments. Have a look at the thing that I've flipped away because, um, yeah, that I might have actually dismissed a very strong argument. Do your own thinking is kind of what I'm saying. Okay, last clip and then we'll finish. Now, one other thing about that. There's a real danger in the ethnicity IQ debate and the, the danger is that we confuse intelligence with value or that we include, we, we confuse intelligence with, yeah, with human value. That's a better way of thinking about it. And one of the things that we're going to have to understand here is that that's a mistake, is that being more intelligent doesn't make you a better person. That's not the case. It makes you more useful for complex cognitive operations. But you can be pretty damn horrific as a genius son of a bitch, right? It's morally neutral. And we also know that from the psychometric data, by the way. There doesn't seem to be any relationship whatsoever between intelligence and virtue. And so if it does turn out that nature and the fates do not align with our egalitarian presuppositions, which is highly probable. We shouldn't therefore make the mistake of assuming that if group A or person A is lower on one of these attributes than group B or person B, that that is somehow reflective of their intrinsic value as human beings. That's a big mistake. Okay, so here I agree with Jordan, you know, well, partially. Um, well, I agree with him, you know, that we shouldn't be making, placing all of this value on intelligence. You know, seen as some sort of, you know, moral virtue for being intelligent. Uh, but I, what, I, what I'm confused about is I don't see how this statement sits with his view that's stated elsewhere, that social hierarchies are not based on power, but based on competence, and that social hierarchies are natural. You know, they occur in animals, so you, you say that they're biologically predetermined for us. You know, that it's just a natural state of things that we have social hierarchies, people on the top and people on the bottom. The problem is that the hierarchy is a structure of distributed value. There are people at the top and they're at the top because they have attributes that are the most valued. Um, you know, they have some trait, some attribute, some competence that's more valued. And there are people at the bottom, and it's because they're at the bottom because they have the least valued traits or competencies. You know? So that hierarchy, he says, exists and it's natural. Now, he explains why people at various points on the hierarchy as because of their competence. Um, and he says that intelligence is a competence, you know. So we would see the hierarchy reflecting people's different levels of competence in relation to occupations, but also intelligence. Yep. You know, the, this hierarchy is a system of social ranking that has to be done on the basis of a value according to something. And Peterson is saying, well, that value, that thing is competence. Now, when you actually think about what Jordan is saying here, he's not really saying much beyond arguing that we should not lock people up for being black. You know, we should not see them as morally bad. We should see them as morally good or no less bad than anyone else, but just as not, but just that they're not as competent at some things. Um, and not very competent, um, particularly in societies where the economy is um, largely structured around work that is cognitively complex, you know, highly industrialized countries, particularly technologically advanced countries. Um, Maybe what he's saying is that we should value black people, but we should value them as, you know, farm laborers or 
factory workers, you know, they're, because their levels of competence are good for manual labor. You know, they haven't got the cognitive skills to be able to um, work in technologically advanced industries. Um, maybe they haven't got the cognitive skills to be able to do planning and strategizing that we need from our managers and our leaders. So maybe they're good just for manual labor and for following simple instruction. Certainly, it would seem prudent if Jordan is right that black people should be following orders rather than giving orders. You know, it's almost an argument for like a benign form of slavery that Jordan is putting forward here. Now, am I, arg am I exaggerating Jordan's position? Am I doing that thing where you exaggerate a point that someone's made to the point at which it looks absurd and then it can be dismissed? Am I doing that? I don't honestly know. Um, it's just because I'm so worried and so many people are worried about this is where this is where Jordan's arguments are kind of leading to us. This is the his, historical legacy of the arguments that Jordan's engaging in when they've been engaged in in the past. This is where we kind of might be heading. And it's just, it's, it's anxiety, really. It's fear. So it's thinking, is this as bad as we think it is? Is this an exaggeration that's just look, making it look absurd just to make this, it, this this person look like an idiot? I don't think it's about that. I think it's real genuine fear that um, something terrible could happen in all of this. But So we need to find that out. We need to think about that. So we need some discussion on Jordan's work and we need critical discussion. Now, this is the end piece. Let's wrap this up. You must have exhausted, unless you've just been watching this in little five-minute five sections, and good on you for doing that. That's a way to get through it. If you have made it all the way through this video, all the way through, right from start to finish, um, even if you're taking breaks, good on you, as they say here in Australia, which means nice job. Um, yeah, just thank you for doing that. And I'm sorry this is so long, but I think, and i uh, sorry if I rambled a little bit, I should have maybe just broken this up and had breaks between, uh, but it is complicated. And I do think we need to look at it really closely and clearly and really think about it and spend a long time thinking about what Jordan's telling us. And because I think there are inherent dangers and flaws in his thinking. Now, if you're a follower of Jordan, um, be assured that, you know, he wouldn't want you to engage uncritically with his ideas. He would want you to spend the time thinking about what he's saying and critically thinking about what he's saying, considering the counter arguments that might um, suggest what he is saying is wrong. He'd, he'd want you to do that. He encourages people to do that. And um, he'd want you to disagree with him um, just so that, you know, you can be more solid and assured that what Jordan is talking is right. But you know, once you've worked through those counter arguments and he's helped you see how those counter arguments are wrong, but also because it gives him the opportunity to get more solid and confident in what he's saying, because there's, you know, he'll, he should concede and he does concede. I think that he, he could be wrong and he needs you to criticize him because he may have missed something. So he needs you to tell him why he's wrong. So be assured of that. Jordan would be happy for you to look at the weak spots in his arguments. Now, if you ever get the impression that he's not, and actually that might be impression that's delivered to you via the platforms he speaks on, you know, that he might be subject to edits like the way I've edited him, that makes him seem as though he's saying something that he's not. That seems to be him saying, sorry, there was a, there was a bang outside. Ugh. I'm sure everything's fine. Um, there seems to be saying that actually he's intolerant towards criticism, he doesn't like criticism, or that he doesn't, he dismisses out counter arguments. It might just pu purely be because of the edit or time constraint or whatever. So just watch out because if you have the opportunity to talk to him in the flesh, you might find that he enjoys the critique and values the critique. Um, but if you ever find out that he doesn't, um, want the critique or encourages critique of his own work um follow him but follow him follow him as a spiritual leader don't follow him follow him as a man of science because the moment that we reject critique of our own work is the moment we step out of that um, um 
it's the moment we hold no credibility as a people of science. We become discredited because science is always looking at reasons why we might be wrong in our thinking. Okay. So again, thanks for sticking with this video. If you're stuck with it, start to end. Oh, it's all way over now. Um, yeah. Let me know your comments. Give me a thumbs up if you found it useful or interesting. And subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. My videos are not usually this long. <laughs> I've now got to replace all of my body fluids, not because I've been getting excited, <laughs> it's because I've been sweating. Anyway, here we go. Where, where am I going? Uh, I'm going to turn the camera off. <laughs> Thanks, and um, see you next time. Ta-da.